The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. All New Covenant spiritual advancing believers, such as us, will suffer for Christ in the world. The spiritual mature church is a great target in the intensification of the angelic conflict. Up at the conference that we had this uh, last weekend, uh, on the closing day I did a study on the church report card. The Lord gives the church a report card, and I dealt with, the, with two, I dealt with one of the seven churches of Revelation chapters 2 and 3 because he's given report cards out. That's my way of view, viewing it. He gives report cards. That's my view. Only two of the churches out of the seven got A+. Plus. Only two. And I told the members of my church that were up there, the leadership that was able to make that meeting, that I think our church is closest, at least in the model in my mind that I want us to be, is the church at Philadelphia. Because it was a mission, a, a high-geared ministry mission church. And, and that's what we've always been. We've always been that church. We came in with that. We have maintained it. And that's, that's who... That's we, who we are, at least under this leadership. And God has circled the wagons with men who, 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 who believe that. The church is responsible for two things, evangelism and spiritual growth maturity. And we've tried to honor that. Uh, um, the church at Philadelphia, one of the earmarks of that church that I really loved, he said, the Lord said, this church learned a very important principle that I, the Lord Jesus Christ, I open doors that no man can shut, and I shut doors that no man can open. See, I believe that. I believe that. I have always believed that for our church. I have always believed that. That's been one of our mottos. In fact, what was interesting to me, that was a high, a high point of discussion at our conference with our leaders before I ever brought it up, and I thought, oh, thank you, Jesus. I meant that it was so good for my soul to see the people understand that principle. God opens doors that no man can shut, and he shuts doors that no man can open. And that was the church at Philadelphia, and I think we have bought into that principle from day one, and we still believe that. In 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 James 4, 7, I want you to look at that. I want you to put your eyes on this, this verse. Now, sometime in the future, and I don't know when that will be, we'll actually get to the fourth chapter in James. Um, I actually got out, of, got out of the first chapter. Um, but we're not in a hurry, are we? Um, just, just in classes, we're not hurry to get through anything. We're, we're just here till the Lord comes. If I can find the book of James there, fourth chapter, verse 7. I just want you to put your eyes on it. Now, you will, most of you will know this verse, but I want you to put your eyes on it because I want to point out a couple of things to you. In fact, I want to point out three things to you, uh, four, four, seven. Listen to what he says. It, by, by the way, I love verse 6 when he talks about greater grace. I mean, grace is sufficient. Can you imagine what greater grace would do? <laughs> I mean, if... If grace is sufficient, imagine what greater grace would be. Well, you'll live it, so you'll know that. But here's verse 7. Submit, therefore, to God, resist the devil, and what? He'll flee from you. But see, he knows what you don't know or do know. See, if the first act you have to do is to what? Submit to God. I said, we talk about inner dialogue around here all the time because you talk to yourself and we say, stop doing that. Talk to the Lord because, you know, he's wiser and he, 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 can, he can supplement everything you're worried about and discussing with yourself. He's got solutions and you don't. That's why you're talking to yourself. 
we don't talk to ourselves. If we got solutions, we just go ahead and do it. But this inner dialogue. So, you see, submit to God. And, and what he's talking about is submitting to God's will, any Submit to God. Submit to God. Whatever you're struggling with, give your struggle up and submit to God. What does God tell? What does God say? I mean, that's what the Bible's for. What does the Bible say about what you're... People come in all the time. They go, Ron, have you got a minute? <laughs> See, I know what that means, don't you, when somebody says, I got a minute? Well, I know what it means. If I sold insurance, I'd probably think it's something different, but, but I don't. So when a person says, you got five minutes, I know, well, we got it. And it always boils down to this. I got a problem, right? And, and with the reason they're with me, is they don't have, they want to be sure that they got the correct. Now, they, they may have several. They, they want to see, if I got all my ducks in a row, I want to be sure that I can engage God because by faith I engage God to do grace in my life, and that's what, the, that's what I want. So I just said, well, well, what do you got? What's, on your, what's, what's your problem, and what solutions have you found from the Word of God? Tell me what you got, and maybe it will only take five minutes. <laughs> Because right? if you got the right answers, I go like, give me five and go. All right? And if not, well, then we'll work on that a little bit. Submit to God. See, the first thing the devil knows, listen, if, if you're not interested in what God's solution is to your problem, the devil's already got, he's got a foot, he's got a foothold. You know, uh, Ephesians, the fourth chapter, when you get down there to around 28, 29, 30, down towards the end of that chapter, he says, one thing you would own, never let the devil get his foot in your door, right? Never let, ne never let him have a foothold in your life. Never let it. And so, so submit to God. What, what's, what, what, submit to God. What's, what's God's solution? What's his problem-solving solution? God has one. Don't worry about it. God has one. Let's make it here. We're on the right page with it. Let's do that. Then watch the second thing. Once you submit to God, then you do what? See, what are you resisting the devil with? Listen, you can't jaw him. He he's a champion jawer. He don't mind. He don't listen. He jawed he jawed Eve right into doing it. He had jaw you. I mean, you you want to listen? You better listen. You got a Matthew four one through eleven with him. If if, if you're going to resist the devil, the only way he'll ever flee from you is to draw the sword of the word of God on him. And you better know what you're talking about. And I don't mean knowing a lot of wisdom. I mean, whatever your problem is, you better throw the word of God that absolutely matches it with it. And listen, that's doable because you've learned it or you wouldn't be having the test. So what you ought to do when you get the test, you ought to pray for the Holy Spirit, because his job in John 14, 26 is not only to teach you, but to recall it. He teaches and recalls. And the word of God, Matthew 4, when, when Satan challenged Jesus Christ, he pulled the, he, and he go like, well, what about this problem? He presents a problem. You're pretty hungry, 40 days without bread. Well, how about this? And he offers Jesus a solution that was common sense, human race solution. Jesus couldn't do that. So Jesus pulled the word of God and says, man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And Satan went, well, he won that round. And so he would go to round two. And Jesus, what did he do? He pulled the word of God categorically, matched it, and devil went, well, round two, I've lost two rounds. I better get busy here. So he threw the third one on him. Jesus did the same thing. He didn't I mean, you know, you got this little throw, they got this little stone, you throw it and say, God hit him right between the eyes and, and Goliath falls. That's how that stuff works. So in Matthew, the fourth chapter, he tells you how to resist the devil. You pull the sword on him because what he wants you to do, he wants you to fall away from God. Because he knows he can put you in a place when you fall away from God that it's a terrifying thing to fall in the hands of a living God. He can put you there. He can't do it if you pull the sword on him because if you pull the sword, the Ephesians 6, 17, in the armor of God, put on the helmet of salvation and pick up the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. 
And by the way, that's a categorical word of God. And he will flee from you. He will flee from you because you've just beat him. He goes like, oh, this guy has been with Jesus too long. This guy has been with Jesus too long. This guy has been with Jesus too long. By that, he means under the word of God. Can't beat the devil. You can sing do, Lord, till you faint. <laughs> I'm going to get it. You got to draw the sword. You got to pull the word of God. And listen, you pull it out of you because it's in you. He would not put you in a test if it wasn't in you. Right? And never beyond what? Able. What you're able to do. Never do that. He'll never do that. Don't lie to yourself. Now he'll never do that. So that's James 4.17. See, all this works because every church age believer is identified with Jesus Christ in the moment of salvation. Listen. Listen, listen, I mean, Satan's a nasty player. If you think he's going to play by the rules, he has none. That's why he's a rebel. He never lives by rules. If he lived by rules, if he lived by rules, he wouldn't have been kicked out. Now, he knows that the Messiah has come, and, and when the caravan from the east comes in with the three magi, right? What were the three stooges called? Stooges. Yeah. See, when they show up, see, that's how the devil looks at them. When they show up, do their little deal. He knows something. He knows something that they know that now is for sure that the Messiah has been born. Christ has come into the world. Christ has appeared into human history, and he knows he's in trouble. Because now he's in countdown. He's in countdown. From that point, it's the first time he's been in countdown. And so what's he try to do? He tries to kill him. Now, why does he want to kill him? Because he doesn't want him to go to the cross. Because when he goes to the cross... He's going to destroy the works of the devil. And so he's after him. He tries to kill him his entire life to keep him from going to the cross. My, my, my. My, my, my. See? And listen, there are a lot of ways the devil attacks you. I wrote a couple of verses on that second page, Matthew 4, 4. You know what he did? He, he confronted them direct. Faith, you know, a direct. Sometimes he attacks you direct, sometimes indirect. He attacked Jesus directly in Matthew 4. In Matthew 16, he attacked him indirectly. Remember Peter? When, when Jesus said, I got to go to Jerusalem, yada, yada, yada. Remember that? And, 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 and Peter go, oh, no, that'll never happen. And he says, get behind me, Satan. There it is. He used Peter that time, didn't he? Yeah. He'll work you. He'll work you. And listen, almost all the time he works you, depends on what your, what your deal is, but he'll work you. Uh, well, you guys go help him. See, see what we got going here. Pantry guy? We need a bag of groceries. Okay. Well, aren't you something, Pam? You just know all this stuff, don't you? Oh, did you do the pantry <laughs> along with the rest of them there? Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. Well, here, look. So Satan, see, look. Here's 1 John 3, 8. Here's what you got to know why Satan's after Christ to keep him from the crucifixion. Because he understands what the purpose of Christ is in the world. The Son of Man, watch this. Now, here's the first coming. The Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, appeared for this purpose. 
to destroy the works of the devil. Now, when he dies on this cross, he dies for our salvation, doesn't he? But he also dies to destroy the works of the devil. See, I tell you, he knows that, whether you know why Christ died for you, see? But he can't afford him. The devil cannot afford to have Christ die on that cross. You understand that? Now, listen, once Christ dies on the cross, now he's in a, he's, he is in a real bind because the, the Christ can destroy his works, has destroyed his works. The church lives above that destructive system. And listen, listen to what Romans, the 16th chapter 20 says, 1620, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. You know what that, that's the second coming of Christ. He's going to crush him. And you know where that comes from? I know Don does. You know where that, you know where that comes from? Genesis 3.15. It's exactly where it comes from. Genesis 3.15. It's exactly where it comes from. Here's point three. Jesus Christ set the example for undeserved suffering in the angelic conflict for you and I. I want you to go to Matt, uh, John 15 for me, and I want you to pay attention. I want you to count the number of time, a number of times the word hate is used and world. This, this will be a really interesting study for you just if you look at those two words and pay attention. I'm in John 15, 18 through 25. That's as far as I'm going to go with it because I just want to show you Pay attention to the word hate and world. If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know the one who sent me. If I had not, if I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have sinned. But now they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works which no man else did, miracles, they would not have sinned, but now they have both seen and hate me and hate my father as well. That, and, then he, and then he goes on one more. But they have done this in order that the word may be fulfilled that is written in their law. They hated me without a cause, a just legal cause. It's, look, you see how that dominates? Jesus said, this is how they treated me. The world hates us. The world hates us. And in spite of that, we must take the gospel to them because the only way it can change them. A good example of that was Saul of Tarsus. He hated. He had him. Got converted. Loved him. Loved him more than his own life. Didn't he? More than my own life. It's a pretty powerful experience called conversion. Being saved. Second Timothy 3 12 says, Indeed, all who live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. The question is not that you're going to be, it's when. And it's how. And what you're going to do about it. And the, it's the world hates you. The world is going to do it because the God of this world hates us. He hates us. He hates us. And our mission is to his world. Why he hates us, we go into his, his field and harvest. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him would not perish. That's the field of service that we live for. That's what we do every day. 
Although he was a son, listen to his suffering. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. There's always lessons in it to be learned. Jesus Christ, the son of God, hypostatic man, learn obedience through the things he suffered to prepare him to go to the cross for the greatest supreme mission of them all. And you should embrace it because he will teach you obedience. That will be the, the charmer of your life. He'll teach you obedience in ways you've never learned it. Obedience. You know, you can learn about obedience in class. When you learn, learn them on the hard knocks of life, you never forget them. You might forget the one you learned in class. You won't forget the one you learned in the field. 1 Peter 2, 21, 22, 22. For you have been called for this purpose. You've been called for this purpose. Are you saved? Are you saved? Do you believe Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised? Hey, then you've been called for this purpose since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor any deceit found in his mouth. Listen, he did this as an example for us to follow. His suffering. Christ suffered for us so that we could suffer for him. Why? Why did he suffer? To bring the world to salvation. Why do we suffer? To bring the world to salvation. We're part of the same team. In Luke 23, 34, Jesus on the cross before he dies says, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. They do not know. They don't understand the end game. They don't understand. Stephen, uh, 2334. It's on your paper. Uh, in Acts 7, 54 uh, through 60, we have Stephen. And, and he's famous for that because he's one of our guys. Lord, he says, do not hold this sin to them against them. Do not hold this sin. They, they, they killed him without a cause, without a legal cause, just like they did Jesus. And, and listen, he says the very similar thing that Jesus said, didn't he? And that's the way the early church took their marching orders. You know why? The world doesn't understand, do they, Lord? And see, that's what he's saying, the Lord. Listen, we're all here to suffer to bring people into the kingdom. We suffer to bring people into the kingdom. We suffer to bring people into the kingdom. We don't just suffer. We suffer to bring people into the kingdom. 2 Corinthians 1 5, for just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, so also our comfort is abundant through Christ. The Galatians in the first chapter 22 through 24 were amazed that the great persecutor of the Christian is now preaching the faith of the Christian. <laughs> they were amazed by that, aren't we all? Well, I don't know that we are, but other people who knew, to, knew us before salvation, after salvation, are amazed that we are. I know, I know people were of me. I can't believe Ron went into ministry. Well, Ron couldn't either. Um, I sure didn't go to college for that. But here I am. Let me close. Let me close with this. What I've told you today is that God has only one backup plan for, but he does have one, right? But he only has one. There's only, there's only one backup plan, and that's God's grace. God is faithful to take care of you. You've got to understand that. Are you saved? If you're saved, you will suffer. The world hates us. The world hates us. If you think you're going to get along with everybody and everybody's hunky-dory with this thing, you, you, you live in a make-believe world as far as Christianity. And we've been, we've been enormously blessed in America. If you went to other nations of the world, you would find that the way we live is not. That's why everybody wants to come here. 
they don't realize, the church doesn't even today realize that we are the beacon of the light of God to the whole world. If they, did, if they really believe that and understood that they would teach more heavy the word of God. Get away from this fluff. You got to grind this stuff out. You got to teach people. It's got to be in your soul. You got to walk it out. That's the only time that God is faithful. That doesn't change his character, but it changes your opinion about it. I heard a guy came in not long ago, and he he said, I've given up on God. I said, you know, if I, if, you remember the old thing, if I had a nickel for every time somebody came into that, I'd be a rich man today. Quit that foolishness. You have no idea what you just said. Give up on God. You're, you're, you're a baby, and I knew that. I'm not going to beat him up because he's a baby believer. But in my mind, I'm going like, he's a baby believer. At least he's coming in a whine. <laughs> he took my bubble gum. But, you know, look, I can't do that with him. He's a baby. You can't do that with a baby. So I have to sit down and say, look, this is going to take three or four meetings. Are you up to this? Maybe. Well, we'll see how it goes. But I can help you. If you want an answer, have you made up your mind that God's a slug? Or you think maybe there could be some reasoning in this? If it is, I'll help you. But, geez. It's important that each of us believe God's grace is sufficient. 2 Corinthians 12, chapter, verse 9. Hey, um, hey, I'm going to check. It's been kind of long. Maybe, maybe we got a prayer meeting going and maybe we don't. But we need to make sure we got. Okay, well, I couldn't because I'm talking, but that's a little longer than we normally have. So, Second um. Corinthians 12, 9, when he says, my grace is sufficient for you, be, be sure you believe that, not just because it's in the Bible, but it's in your heart. My grace is sufficient. And you, one of the reasons I like, I, I, re, I highly recommend you do journals. I highly recommend it. You know why? Because, and be sure that when God does something great or when you're struggling, you document it. Just put it in it. We're okay. Uh, okay. Well, you know, got a security system, but we might have to have one inside too, you know. Um, my grace is sufficient for you. For Now, watch what he says. And this is when grace is really, this is when grace is sufficient. Listen, watch what he says. For power is perfected in weakness. See, when you really see that God's grace is sufficient is when you're, you're, you're weak. And you know it. And you go like, how am I going to get out into the next how am I going to get out of this frame of mind? How am I going to get out of where I am? Listen, here's the, here's the principle. Power is what? Perfected. P power is power. Yeah, be, listen. Power turns the lights back on. <laughs> you know what? It gets, a, it gets a refrigerator running again. The stove can work. TV comes on. You know? Now I can figure out why. why. The telephone works. Oh, I can call. Power is perfected in weakness. Power is perfected in weakness. Now, now watch what he says. Most gladly, therefore. You see, when power is perfected in weakness, there ought to be a joyful attitude about it, shouldn't there? And listen, there normally is. You know, when you're down, when you're without power and uh, you've got a lot of food in the refrigerator, I, I think every time power goes off, I think about dying. I mean, you got a generator? Oh, Don, Don, with all that meat? Well, how does that keep your refrigerator from thawing? <laughs> oh, well, Don, aren't you, aren't you smart, you alternative guy? We're gonna cook. Well, next time, just let us know. We'll be right out there to have some of that. Yeah, dry ice. Well, I didn't mean to get into this subject, but... My, my mind, my grace is sufficient. 
I know. Thank you, Don. Thanks for getting me back on track. Um, po powers perfected in weakness, most, glad most gladly, therefore, watch this, I would rather boast about my weaknesses. See, that's when you know God can conquer them. Right? And we do. We give testimony to them. And other people, you know how many people, when you go through something and you win over this deal in your life, you, 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 do you ever, this is why a journal is good. You know how many people he brings to you to tell them that? It's amazing, isn't it? It's amazing how many people he'll bring that in your life to, to, so that you're able to encourage them through the journey you just walked. It's amazing. And that's what he's telling. I would rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may remain in me, remain active in me. Now watch the word, but not. And here's how I, I gotta, I'm going to finish up. We're going to go home. We're going to go to your home, Sam. We're going to Sam's. I love it. Sam, Sam don't care. He must have a private room somewhere where he can go and hang out. He must have a private room. That's me, Sam. You can come to my house because I go, I go away and you just visit. Uh, and then just lock the door when you leave. Uh, watch this. But not. Watch the but nots. But not. You with the but nots? Okay, we're with the but nots. This is my whole class tonight, the but nots. Watch this. We are afflicted. Here's undeserved suffering. We are afflicted in every way. Boy, that's Max, isn't it? That's north, south, east, west. But not crushed. You know why? Because God is faithful. Perplexed. Perplexed. But not despairing. Persecuted. Not forsaken. Struck down. But not destroyed. You know why? God is faithful. But listen, there's the angelic conflict. There is undeserved suffering. There's undeserved, afflicted, perplexed, persecuted, struck down. But there's a way of escape. Right? So, a good little read for you uh, is to sometime go in and take a look at the Church of Philadelphia because I really believe that's who we are. And I... I approach my ministry and have for 40 some years, 44 years or so with the church at Philadelphia in my heart, because that's been my model. And because I think that we most line up with that agenda. So you might go and take a look at that because um, once again, we're faced with some pretty good issues, open doors, you got to pay attention to the doors God opens that no man can shut. No man can shut. And the shut doors that no man can open. And people go to the mission field like Rick's about to go to the mission field. Horton goes out in the mission field all the time. It's all about open doors. And once he finds an open door, he knows he's got it. And no man can shut it. And he don't try to go through a door that's shut. No man can open. And that's a very important principle. Father, we're so thankful tonight for these who have come our way by automobile and the Internet. We pray, Father, that people, especially on the Internet, who have never heard this stuff before, would begin to go and search upon our website. We have plenty of information because we've been doing this stuff for 40-some years, and there's a lot of information on this subject matter, and it would do them well to study it. Uh, because it's been granted for us to believe in Jesus Christ and to suffer for his sake and uh, not for our own. So, Father, we thank you for this time together. Uh, encourage us. Give a good night's rest, Father. We thank you for this church. We thank you for the ministry that flows from it. I am so thankful to pastor such a church. It's such rewarding to me and Jane. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Hey, Lord, just before I leave, I need to pray for Kenny Smith, who had eye surgery today, and I need to pray for Rick Broadhead, who had uh, surgery today. And Glenda, we're going to pray, Father, for her. Get that boot off and get that foot well. Oh, well, I'm not commanding anything, Father. I'm just saying we sure would like that done. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says that God was in Christ, 
reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us.